Hello, and welcome to another edition of Rail Rangers on the Road. The Midwest Rail Rangers, our 501c3 nonprofit organization, presents onboard educational programs across the Midwest. You may have caught us on the South Shoreline between Chicago and South Bend, Indiana, aboard the Sky Parlor car at the Wisconsin Great Northern, on an Amtrak charter organized by the 20th Century Railroad Club of Chicago, on private rail excursions featuring heritage equipment, and at various outreach events such as Train Fest and Mad City Rail. In March of 2020, the coronavirus sidelined most of our programs. After taking a few months off, we returned with virtual programs, taking you to exciting rail destinations across Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Michigan, Minnesota, Missouri, and Wisconsin. With 2021 now here, we hope to begin the transition back to doing in-person programs. During the months ahead, though, we will continue to bring you new virtual programs as well. So sit back and relax and enjoy another edition of Rail Rangers on the Road. Hello everybody, welcome to another virtual program with the Midwest Rail Rangers. I'm Midwest Rail Ranger President Robert Taburn here with you. As you can see, we are in uh, Duluth, Minnesota. Uh, we are live actually here in Duluth, Minnesota tonight. It is the 6th day of June here on a Sunday night and we first want to thank the uh, Lake Superior Railroad Museum for uh, staying open a little bit later than they normally would for us tonight. Uh, it is uh, about 7.03 p.m. here, uh, Sunday, June 6, 2021. And we have an exciting uh, program, not only this program for you, but also our next program. Uh, this program, we are going to focus exclusively on the Lake Superior Railroad Museum. Uh, Kiedis is in place, and we're going to bounce uh, through about six places here in the museum for you tonight. Uh, that's our plan, to show you six of our favorite spots here at the Lake Superior Railroad Museum. Uh, so we hope you enjoy that, and then you'll also want to mark your calendars for two weeks from tonight, which is Sunday, June 20th, where we're going to be back up here uh, in Duluth two weeks from tonight, June 20th, and we're going to go on a dome car ride on the North Shore Scenic Railroad. Uh, both of these are very special places and worth a visit, and uh, when we were planning our programming, we thought we would uh, kind of jam both of them into one program, but boy, there's so much to do up here, we decided to give each of these their own program here in the month of June. So we hope everyone's starting to enjoy the start of summer, 2021, and uh, let's begin our first part of the program here, Lake Superior Railroad Museum, I believe Candace is... Just down that way, and she's going to show us some railroad china. Well, thank you, Robert. I'm here aboard number car 68 at the railroad museum here, and we're going to show you the dining car china of the different railroads. So here we have Wayne, the Elgin, Juliet, and Eastern. We have the Illinois Central. That's a very pretty. The coral is very pretty. The Chicago Northwestern down here. You got the one with the 400 on the plate back there. And the wild rose pattern. We have the Broadway Limited China here up at the top. The next one is the Pennsylvania Railroad. And you see that they actually have their logo on their china. New York Central. And the Pace 
pacemaker for the New York Central. We have the Southern. The Minneapolis St. Paul and Sault Ste. Marie and the Sioux line right here. You got the Sioux line engine, steam engine in the back there you saw. The Logan pattern. All right. Missouri Pacific up at the top on this case. Oh, and look at this beautiful China here. This is the Atchison, Topeka, and the Santa Fe China. We've got the poppy, the California poppy from, from the Santa Fe. And then another pattern down here. Uh, Southern Pacific up at the top here. We've got a plate there with the Alamo on it. That's pretty cool. Western Pacific and then Southern Pacific. And of course, we can't leave out the Northern Pacific. There's a uniform there. And then there's China. Theirs wasn't as much detail as the other ones I'm starting to notice. And then we'll take you in here in this room real quick just to show you the setup and then we'll come back and look at the other side. So here's the setup. And then we'll take you back and show you the other side of the railroad china here. Union Pacific, they so said this is the historical 1927 to 1949 China here on the end. And some different patterns from the Union Pacific there. few more from the UP. Here's some more great northern china that we were looking at in this display case. That one's pretty. I like the mountains in the background there. Looks like they had several different patterns with this railroad. And of course, Robert's favorite, the Milwaukee Road China, the, the trumpeter swan. And we have the, the peacock on there for the Chicago, Milwaukee, St. Paul and Pacific. Also the Milwaukee Road. Here's our new favorite, the Quincy Burling, Burlington and Quincy Railroad. Here's the aristocrat pattern. We have 
the South Shore, but not the South Shore that we're on. And then you'll toss it to me. Menu, pop up menu for kids at the Great Northern Book. All right, the last one is the Duluth and Iron Range. And then we're going to give it over to Robert now for the next part of the museum. All right, thanks a lot, Candace. Uh, enjoyed the tour of the Railroad China. Very cool. Uh, I'm here just uh, about 50 feet from Candace. We'll let her move on to another part of the museum while I give you a tour of some of the equipment here down the, sec the second aisle of the museum. Here I'm going to show you the hand cart. I've always wanted one of these things. Uh, they were designed for railroad section crews and maintain four to probably at most about 12 mile segments of a main line or branch line track. These hand cars would hold several men along with picks, spikes, signal uh, flags, shovels, and other tools of the trade. Their work was often dangerous in the early years as trains came with little warning because they didn't have the signals. And imagine if you were on this hand cart pumping here versus uh, a train coming, who would win that battle? So it was very dangerous in the early years. Uh, the hand cart still racked up pretty good miles going back and forth. Average speed was about eight miles an hour, depending on how much coffee the men had in the morning. These cars were replaced with motorized gasoline fueled versions by the 1920s. Now here's, now this might look familiar. We were just a couple weeks ago. Uh, if you watched the, the last Rail Ranger, one of our last Rail Ranger videos, we were up in International Falls, Minnesota, and uh, our friend Linton Brooks took us on a ride on one of, one of these type of cars. And while you look at that, I'll tell you, this is a section car. I won't tell you too much more, because hopefully you watched our video. It was Candace and I's first ride in one of these section cars. These small cars seen here were used in the maintenance of track and other related parts of the railroad. Trackage was divided into sections, and a crew was assigned to maintain and inspect each section, thus requiring vehicles to carry tools for repairs. The average length of a section, remember we mentioned the other one, was up to 12 miles? Well, now they have these motorized section cars, and they could go up to 20 miles. The easiest forms are represented by the pump car, which should be operated by any number of men, depending on their stamina or terrain, or as I mentioned, how much coffee they had in the morning. The smaller velocipedes were usually one-man cars, and they were often used over shorter distances, maintain lamps and signals within yard limits. And then eventually the gasoline power motor car um, came into being as represented by the early model from Fairmount uh, Railroad Motors of Fairmount, Minnesota. And then there's a powered version of one of the one-man cars that was used for uh, switch tending. So you can see, look at some of these early uh, carts over here. As we mentioned, how they all this is one of the earliest ones, and then a little bit more modern over here. And then while I have you over here, let's take a, you're kind of going in the opposite direction, but I'll show you the Masabi logo. And we learned, we uh, got a chance to meet, we'll throw up a picture, uh, if you're familiar with the museum, we got a chance to meet and get a quick tour with uh, Ken Mueller, who's the executive director. He came in to say hi to us, as you can see in the picture we're throwing up here. He's done a lot of videos as well. Uh, and Ken gave us a tour. And he told us what Masabi means. Do you remember? Any idea what Masabi means? Well, we'll tell you a little bit later. We'll tell you at the end of what Masabi. So think about it. It's a Native American word. I'm not going to tell you what it is now. We'll tell you at the closing video uh, what Masabi means. No Googling. Anyway, let's take a look at Sioux Line Caboose 99017. As you can see, it says a Sioux Line on it. It was constructed in 1886 for the Wisconsin Central. This caboose is one of the oldest in existence. 
the Wisconsin Central was leased to the Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Sault Ste. Marie Railroad in 1909 and officially merged with the Sioux Line in 1961. In 1951, the Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Sault Ste. Marie Railroad Company adopted the nickname Sioux Line as official for all except for legal business. As you look at cabooses in the museum, maybe we'll show you a few more today, and note the differences in appearances. Most railroads, you know, basic design when you picture a caboose, this is kind of what you picture, uh, which evolved through the years though. There was distinctive to its own line. It could easily be seen that the caboose is noticeably different from others in the museum. Of course, this is one of the differences, the type of material, and this is wood versus metal uh, cabooses or cabees. I don't know. Let's look at some of the other equipment. We still have a few minutes for Candace to get some place at the next car. This is some old luggage. Pretty cool. And it looks like we have a car from the Hanna and Moore Mining Company, number 307. And let me tell you a little bit more about this car. It was constructed by General Electric in 1928. Number 307 is typical of steeple cab electric locomotives formerly used in mining and industrial railroad operations. Ken had the, the chance to tell us um, why mining was such a major industry in this area. The locomotive was built for use at the Wasabi Chief Mine near Kowadin, Minnesota. 600 volt DC electric power was received by means of a sidearm current collector in contact with an off-center overhead trolley wire. This was necessary since if the trolley wire was located over the center of the track, the steam shovels could not load ore into the cars. When 307 reached the end of the line or needed to go on an unpowered siding, a cord from the front-mounted drum working like an extension cord allowed the engine to travel away from the overhead trolley wire. Um, and this locomotive was donated here to the museum right from the Hanna Mining Company in 1974. Well, let's see what this is. This is pretty cool. That is one big hook. Look at that. Any idea what this is? This is a Northern Pacific Steam Power Record number 38. You can see by the hook. Um, this was constructed in 1913 by the Industrial Works at Bay City, Michigan. One of the few steam-powered wrecking cranes now in existence, number 38, is very unique. Most wreckers of its vintage were scrapped or converted to diesel. With the 75-ton lifting capacity, the wrecker is quite small. Most modern railroad wreckers were built with 160 to 100 or 300-ton capacity. Wreckers were taken to the site of a derailment and were used to pick up cars and engines and place them back on the track. So yeah, if you had Candace driving a locomotive, I bet you need one of these. Most wreckers of this style, whether steam or diesel powered, are now considered obsolete. Railroads prefer wreckers that can travel on highways as well as the rail to give them more flexibility when you uh, look at derailments. I'm in Michael's company of Duluth, donated number 38 to the museum in 1976, and restoration was performed by the Duluth, Winnipeg, and Pacific Railroad at its Virginia, Minnesota shops. Well, let me show you just uh, two more. I'll show you a couple more things real quick. Down the second center aisle. These are some railroad batteries. Kind of an exhibit about the batteries. The batteries, um, as you can see, all the batteries uh, supply direct current. And this gives you an idea. Think of your battery in your car compared to what these are. And this is um, the Chicago, Milwaukee, and St. Paul 10200B. And General Electric. Pretty cool. Do we want to go up in the cab? Why not? Get some hand sanitizer here. Let's take you up in the cab. I'll show you. A 
You gotta watch your head here if you're coming up. We'll show you here. And you can see some of the exhibits I showed you, the crane and the, some of the motor cars. Pretty cool. So let's walk down here. I always love these big engines. They're tight quarters, that's for sure. Over here, I'm going to show you out the window, you have a great uh, northern caboose, the X552. You can't afford an accident. Oh, sorry. Pretty cool. Well, I just got a message that Candace is ready for her next uh, exhibit. We gave her enough time, we showed you some stuff. Let's swing it live over to Candace, who uh, she just sent me a message. And, uh, oh, where is she? She's out there somewhere. And she's going to show you what a, we're going to show a quick video of, she said, uh, what a railroad post office is. And then she's going to give us a tour inside the uh, railroad post office or RPO exhibit. So let's watch the little video uh, and then Candace is standing by to tell you more about the uh, railroad post office. Candace? Mail oh. by rail helps tie together the business economy, the free press, and the human relations of this great country. People's mail, going someplace, coming from someplace. People's possessions, things they are buying, selling, or giving away. On the move. Men working the mail race the speeding train toward the next station. It's a driving force that keeps them on their toes and never lets them quit. Now watch how they catch mail on the fly with the help of a mail messenger. Ten minutes before the train is scheduled to pass a non-stop station, the mail messenger carefully hangs the special catcher pouch of mail. After it is securely fastened, top and bottom, he steps aside and waits nearby to witness the catch and receive any mail which may be thrown off. Aboard the train, local mail is being tied out as the clerk spots his landmark. This was it. Must get every letter package for this dispatch in the pouch and tied out. The race against time and speed was on. As soon as the last pouch is made ready, the car grabs his safety goggles and goes to his station. The engineer is required to signal the RTO car that they are approaching the non-stop station. <laughs> In Cappy's crew, the local clerk was getting ready to make an exchange. First, he put on his safety goggles. the capture arm. This time, for Phil's sake, he demonstrated the mechanism, pushing down to show the capture arm being lifted outside the train. With one hand, he tossed the pouch out and down, assisted with his foot. With the other hand, he brought down the catcher handle, and the catch was made. A neat two-handed operation. To save the public precious hours and days in delivery, Railway mail clerks stored in exchange great quantities of letters and printed matter. 
Yes, men and mail in transit. Feed the mail on speeding trains. Affecting dramatic exchanges almost every minute of the day. These, then, are your postal transportation clerks in action, whose efforts and sacrifice speed onward the vital correspondence of our great nation from darkness, deluge, or disaster. Well, thanks for letting us watch that short video, Robert, about the RPO car. Here is the catcher's arm that they talked about, that they would swing out to catch the bag of mail. Here is the area where they would sort the mail. So you see the upper cabinets here, probably for large parcels maybe. Then you have the small boxes there that they would sort into, straight ahead. By zip code. By zip code. And then they had the sorting table, of course, here by the bags. And this is an ex-Northern Pacific RPO. So thanks for joining us. We're going to join Robert in another part of the museum. And he's going to give you some more information about some of his favorite exhibits here. All right. Thanks a lot, Candace. I appreciate that. And we are not too far from you. Hope everybody learned a, a little bit about railroad post offices. And we are going to take a look here at this old historic steam locomotive which is definitely one of the show places show pieces of the uh, museum up here in Duluth and we hope everybody comes up here and, and checks this really cool out you can see there's the builders play look at that 1861 which is the start of the Civil War that is an old locomotive the William Crooks if you've ever been up here, I'm sure you've seen this on display. But we could not not do a... This is one of our pieces that we're doing today. Beautiful. So let me tell you a little history here. The St. Paul and Pacific was the first railroad in Minnesota, and the William Crooks was the first steam locomotive to run in the entire state. So you're definitely looking at a piece of history here. Eventually, the St. Paul and Pacific became the St. Paul, Minneapolis, and Manitoba Railroad in 1879. And in uh, 1890, part of the Great Northern Railroad. The locomotive that we're looking at uh, this evening was constructed by New Jersey Locomotive and Machine Company of Patterson, New Jersey, and is named for William Crooks. He was the chief mechanical engineer. of the St. Paul and Pacific and Colonel of the 6th Regiment, Minnesota Volunteers. We mentioned the Civil War. Well, there you go. He was, uh, he was also in the uh, fought for the Union. The William Crooks arrived in St. Paul by steamboat on September 9, 1861. On June 28, 1862, the locomotive was hauled by the historic first train load of passengers here in Minnesota, a distance of 10 miles between St. Paul and St. Anthony, where St. Anthony is now called Minneapolis. Regular service between St. Paul and St. Anthony, again, now known as Minneapolis, began on July 2nd, 1862. One of the few remaining locomotives of the Civil War period, the Crooks was retired from active service around the turn of the century. In its heyday, the locomotive handled Empire Bill James J. Hill's private trains as well as regular passenger trains of the period. The engine weighs 28 tons, or 51 tons with the tender, and is 50 feet, 8 and 1 fourth inches long. The Crooks was built as a wood burner. In recent times, the Crook traveled under its own steam to Chicago and the New York World's Fairs. Its last trip under steam was to the railroad fair in Chicago in 1948. The locomotive was donated to the Minnesota Historical Society by the Great Northern Railway, and has been here in Duluth since May of 1975. Very beautiful and very historic piece. You can get another shot of the builder plate there. 
Well, let's see what else is down here real quick. So a lot of historic, uh, if you ever get a chance, they have some model railroad uh, displays here for you. Some other historical displays. Um, this is the, uh, you know, the action of compressing air up to 130 pounds makes it hot, about 350 degrees in a hard-working compressor. Therefore, the air first passes through pipes, cooling coils before going into the storage tanks. If hot air gets into the actual braking system and then cools down, dropping the pressure, it could cause the brakes to apply on their own since in railroad braking systems, it is a drop, not a rise, but a drop in pressure in the air brake line that causes the brakes to apply using air that is stored on each car. And uh, well, we'll show you one more car. This is, I have to put this one up here because this is car number one. And I was walking through the museum, this kind of caught my attention. Being car number one, you know it's historic. This is one of the first passenger cars of the St. Paul and Pacific. Uh, the number one is a coach baggage combine. Uh, a little over half the car length is a baggage area, and the rest has 18 uh, coach seats in it. The car is typical of the coach building style of the era. Again, this is 1862. So, kind of the same area, uh, same era as the William Crooks coach uh, number one from 1862. Uh, note that even part of the truck frames are made from wooden timbers. Obviously is relatively rare. Heat in the car was provided by a coal stove, Ken, uh, Ken Bueller told us. Uh, cooling came only from open windows and ventilators in the roof, a method that allowed a great deal of dust to enter the car. The dirt, smoke, and cinders were the bane of travelers during hot weather. The seats are simple metal frames and the cushions are horsehair padded and covered in leather. Note the car has a simple uh, arched roof. The compartment used uh, under the compartment under the car use, was used to carry tools. I'm gonna take a look at that. So pretty cool. I'm thinking this has been around from the Civil War. So definitely worth the the chance if you're anywhere near Duluth or even the Twin Cities to to come come up here. And there's car number three attached to it. So definitely lots of history, lots of cool things to see here at the uh, museum in Duluth. But we're not done yet. We still have two more segments before we wrap it up tonight. I'm going to go ahead and throw it to Candace, who uh, has uh, one, more, one more of her segments uh, to show us. Candace, where are you at? Well, you found me. I'm right here at the caboose, because, you know, we all have to see our cabooses. Uh, yeah, okay. This caboose was built for the DWP, the Duluth, Winnipeg, and Pacific. Its car number 76932 was built in 1911 and represents the standard design for this railroad. It was built by the Canadian National Railway. And it is also a wooden caboose. Wood. Knock on wood. This caboose came from an era when cabooses were usually assigned to the crew. Thus it became a home away from home. Crews would eat, sleep on the cabooses since there was almost, this was the most convenient way to deal with their needs. The caboose was also a rolling office for the conductor who would use the, ta the desk to take care of the way bills and other paperwork associated with the train's movement. This caboose was donated to the museum in 1974. And now let's take you aboard for the look at the inside of the caboose. Watch your step. Well, welcome aboard everyone. This looks like this would have been the sleeping area. It looks like there's beds here that are pushed up against the wall that they can lower down and put their mattresses on, kind of like over here. There's a mattress to sleep on, not very 
Not very comfortable. It looks like they're pretty rough. Not like our beds today. So then here's the desk that I was talking about for the conductor. He would sit here and take care of his paperwork. Maybe even on this other side if need be. Looks like there's some little office stuff here. Looks like that's a picture of the route that this particular caboose would have been on. And they didn't have your standard electricity back in the day like we do now, so they lit everything by kerosene lamps. These actually say CN on them, so probably not original. You got your boiler, your cooktop stove where they would warm up their food. My favorite place, the cupola. And then as we exit the caboose, we all know what this is, right? Steering wheel? No, oh. the handbrake. Oh. So we'll go down and I'm going to show you some really cool stuff that they have outside of the caboose. So we have this equipment here. Does anybody know what this might be? Well, the large component to the right is what passes for the caboose these days. It is mounted on the rear coupler of the last freight car on the train. Is that a Fred? The end of the train, or EOT, or Fred. Ah. Flashing rear end device. Devices come in many forms, but all provide a flashing red light to warn following trains. In addition, radio signals allow engine crew to make sure that there's power to the, uh, is proper brake pressure at the rear end of the train also. Another important safety feature with this new device is the ability to set the brakes from the rear using radio signals. This improvement was promoted by several runaway train accidents that could have been prevented. The control panel of these devices is mounted in the cab of the locomotive and it gives air pressure readouts and has switches to signal the rear end components to release the air which sets the brakes. So thank you for coming aboard the caboose with me today. We're going to go find Robert now and see what he's up to. Well, thanks a lot, Candace. Finding me, let me tell you folks, finding me, not always an easy thing. Anyway, I want to bring you aboard before we wrap things up tonight. We want to bring you aboard uh, the Northland, which is one of the private cars um, here. I believe you can charter it out on excursions for your family. I believe maybe up to six people. Don't quote me on that. But let's take a look. Um, right, we'll put the camera right up against the glass and take a peek on the inside. Unfortunately, it's closed. Uh, this car was built by Pullman in 1916. Uh, Northland was the last of the Duluth, Masabi, and Northern Railways business cars, ordered by DM&N President William A. Nagano. The Northland replaced business car Masabi, which we got to see a little bit earlier, which is being restored by the museum. The Northland is of all steel construction, including the interior bulkheads, which have been uh, grained to look uh, like rich mahogany wood. When the Duluth, Masabi, and Northern, and Duluth, and Iron Range, they merged in 1938, the car became the property of the new Duluth, Masabi, and Iron Range Railroad. The car measures 82 feet long and weighs roughly 100 tons. It is essentially the same today as it was when it first was put into service. Though a few modifications have been made. Roller bearing journals were added in 1949. 
ice activated air conditioning and a propane generator were installed in 1950 and a propane fired hot water boiler was installed in 1988. Numerous improvements have been made to the original 32 volt DC electric system. Car Northland was added to the National Register of Historic Places in 1978. So one of the few, um, I guess, rolling uh, pieces. The Northland uh, has been in continuous service since the construction and has hosted many notable passengers including King Olaf of Norway. No, not the snowman from uh, Frozen. King Olaf of Norway. And President Calvin Coolidge, who was president during uh, the 1920s. The car appears in the role of James Chase Hill's Great Northern Railway private car in the film Iron Will, which was filmed in and around Duluth during the winter of 1992 into January of 1993. The museum purchased the Northland and its companion car, W24, from the Duluth Masabian Iron Ring Railroad in July of 2003. So it's been here about 18 years now. Still in operations, it's used uh, for special events. And we mentioned that you can charter it as well. Oh, very cool. So yeah, check out their website. Um, you can charter this. Uh, for your family and ride it on the North Shore Scenic Railroad. They have the price and various listings. So let's go and take a look at what uh, the side of the car looks like in just a second. Showing you some of the other stuff behind here that we're running short on time tonight. I'm not going to get a chance to, to see. But we don't want to show you everything because we want you to come and, and check this out for yourself. So, yeah, you might want to charter this for one of their excursions. It's kind of cool over here. They have, uh, it kind of fits in with the theme. They have old-time barber shops and, and old, uh, you know, old-time villas. So it kind of fits in with the theme here. And there it is, the Northland. So think of that. For a couple hundred bucks, you can add this onto one of their trains. And you could ride in the same car as perhaps President Calvin Coolidge. They do have a video here, uh, too, that shows some pictures and whatnot. And here's some pictures also of how you can charter it. And a little bit more of what the interior looks like. So you can have a meal there. I believe that you can add that to the dinner train and have a meal. And look at that, you can even stand out on the back platform. Pretty cool. And there's the other side over here. So it's just kind of cool they have um, barn doors where so if someone does charter the car and it's gonna go out on one of the excursions. And you just open the doors and they have a switch engine come and take the car and they add it onto the train as part of the package costs. Well, we hope you enjoyed the tour of the museum. I'm going to uh, send it to Candace, who's going to uh, wrap up this segment. It's been good to see you. And Candace tell, will tell you about our next program uh, that we have coming up in two weeks from today, uh, which is the second part of the uh, Railroad Museum, but she'll tell you more about that. Candace? Well, thank you very much, Robert, for that wonderful tour of the Northland car that you can charter out from this railroad and put on the end of their excursion trains. Uh, we'd like to thank you for joining us. Join us in two weeks, two weeks, June 20th, for our next virtual program. It's a ride on their North Shore Scenic Railroad. You can buy this book for $15. It's got great information about the railroad. Um, we're here with the 2435. And the Mini Tonka steam engine. So please join us June 20th for the ride aboard the North Shore Scenic Railroad.